Good evening, everyone. My name is Ben Trobiani, and I'm here from Arthritis South Australia. And I welcome everyone to our webinar for this month, which is Food and Arthritis. And really, we're looking into how to separate the fads and the fiction from the science. So first and foremost, I'd like to do an acknowledgement of country. Um, today, me and Evangeline, we both are on Ghana country and respect the elders past, present and emerging and um, increase that as respect to any Indigenous or First Nations people who join today. Um, this webinar has been made possible through funding from the Country South Australian Primary Health Network. And I'd like to make sure that everyone's aware that our questions and answering, even though we'll be doing this at the end, is open for the entire presentation. Now our presenter tonight is Evangeline Mansioris. Um, she's an accredited practicing dietitian and sports dietitian. Um, she's also the program director at the University of South Australia's Nutrition and Food Science degree. And more importantly, a member of the National Health and Medical Research Council's Australian um, Dietary Guidelines Expert Review Committee. That one's a bit of a mouthful. Um, Evangeline has extensive experience in clinical practice of dietetics and also really teaching. So Evangeline's passions really goes from more so from just that actual one-on-one -on -one practice, but really has appeared across lots of different media. So that's radio, television, print media, and then as a regular writer for the conversation online as well. Evangeline does a lot of research and her interests include fats, sports nutrition, the Mediterranean diet, and then at the moment has some um, online surveys that she'll talk about, about herbs and spices and menopause. So I'd like to welcome Evangeline um, and thank you so much for your time tonight. My pleasure and thank you so much for having me and a big thank you to Arthritis SA for inviting me to come and talk to you about food and arthritis. Um, so as Ben said, um, I work at UniSA and I have um, a whole range of different research areas that I'm quite interested in. Um, but originally, my research started out with my PhD, where I looked at fatty acids and rheumatoid arthritis. So really, arthritis was and is still my first love. So let's get started. Um, as we said, we're here to look at food, supplements, diets, and to separate the fads from the fiction. So let's have a look firstly at what science is. Um, whenever you mention science, people get really, you know, oh, that's so confusing we don't understand it and so it is viewed as a terribly complex thing and that you need a science education to understand it but I just want to delve into it a little bit and tell you exactly what science is. So science is the systematic process that we use to understand the natural world around us and it's often through observation first and then through observation we develop experiments to test what we want to find out and then we analyze it and then we use what we call evidence-based methods to test and refine the potential explanations that we have for what we're looking at. And the evidence-based methods are things that have already been accepted in the science world and that other people have used. And we know it's a true way of finding out the answer. Now, that still might confuse people as to what science is. So I'm going to go the opposite and show you what science isn't. And that might give you a little bit more clarity about what science is. So science doesn't care how we feel about things. So for an example, you might have picked from my name that my background is Greek. And one of the most famous Greek desserts, of course, is baklava. And the fact that I like it, even though I'm a dietitian, I've got a PhD and I know all about the way that fats and foods are interact with our body, it doesn't matter what I think about it. Science will still tell us that having baklava every day is bad. So that's the first important thing. Secondly, science isn't what your mother tells you. And I'm a mum, and I probably wouldn't say this out too loud to my kids, but this is the important thing. It's not what your mum tells you, and it's not even what your grandma tells you either. And then if we push it a little bit further, a lot of people find out things from neighbours, but science isn't what your neighbour tells you either. And this is probably the big one. <laughs> where a lot of the fad and uh, confusion comes is that science isn't what celebrities tell us. And this um, gentleman is quite a famous um, celebrity and, you know, a very good cook, but had delved into the health arena. And, you know, with all the fines he's had to pay for the products he's been trying to sell, this is just to remind you that what celebrities tell you isn't science either. 
And it's certainly not what food companies tell us. I don't know how you will. You can see this ad, but it's an ad by a very famous soft drink company. And it says no added preservatives, no artificial flavors, the real thing since 1886. And whilst they may consider the products they put in there aren't called preservatives or artificial flavors, it's really not an accurate depiction of their product. And science is certainly not a personal anecdote or a testimonial. Now, I'm not sure how many of you remember this young lady. Her name is Belle Gibson. Probably about six or seven years ago, um, she was given awards for being the most inspiring woman that you've met. She, um, had, she claimed that she had cancer and that she was able to reverse the cancer by clean eating. And clean eating means just, you know, eating food that is unprocessed and the sad thing here is that she actually um, convinced people who were suffering from cancer to stop taking their treatment and trying the clean eating approach to you know treat themselves from the cancer with you know quite disastrous impact on a couple of people who actually died from it a couple of years later she was actually found to be a fraud and to have lied that she originally had the initial cancer diagnosis so we've got to be really careful about the sources of information and who's telling us. Science just reports the facts. It's totally objective. As I said at the beginning, it doesn't care what we think. And science is certainly not what you are told on Facebook. So um, there's lots of stuff that goes on Facebook. It's most often never verified. And it's either put up by celebrities or influencers who are paid by companies to represent the products that those companies make. So always being cautious there. But John Cleese has, um, in the, what was it, in, oh, almost six years ago, 2016, maybe a few more, few years than six, he said, I would like 2016 to be the year when people remembered that science is a method of investigation and not a belief system. And that's probably the most important thing. It's, as I said at the beginning, it's the way we look at problems. It's the way we look at the world around us. And it's not about what you believe because science doesn't care about what you believe in. So with that, um, there's this lovely pyramid here that shows us the types of evidence, um, not evidence, which is problematic to listen to. And up the top, it's wellness bloggers, celebrities, personal anecdotes. They've got cousins, best mates, brothers, girlfriend. Dr. Google. Dr. Google might give us clues about what's happening, but it's certainly not an evidence base because it's not able to put it into the context of who you are and your personal medical background. And it goes on to show you all the different things. And it's also not an N of one study. So just because one person does something and has an improvement, which might be really real, it doesn't mean that that one person, that result in that one person can be translated to a whole group of people or even to a larger population. But this is what we do rely on um, for our evidence when we're talking about science. And this might be a little bit hard to see, but right at the bottom, we have background information, experts' opinion, and non-evidence-based guidelines. And an expert opinion would be someone like myself. So you can see, even with me being an accredited dietitian, um, working at you know the NHMRC level, looking at dietary guidelines and the lecturer, my opinion still is very low on the evidence base. What I'm able to do, though, is interpret the evidence, and the evidence is what we see above there. So individual case reports, case series or studies, cohort studies, and they're what we call observational studies in science. So we don't change anything in those experiments or those studies. We just look to see what's happening at a population. And from that, we get really good clues, and then we decide to do an experiment. And those are the experimental studies you see there, the non-randomised controlled trials or the randomised controlled trials. <laughs> Excuse me. And then up the top, we have critically appraised literature and evidence-based practice guidelines, systematic reviews, and meta-analyses. And these are where whole bodies of work, so lots of different, for example, randomised controlled trials are pulled together, and we can look at the evidence to see what all of those studies tell us. Even just picking one of those studies isn't good enough because it's effectively cherry picking for perhaps the result that you're keen to see. So most of the evidence that I am looking at today is what we'll consider mostly systematic reviews or meta-analyses or evidence-based practice guidelines. 
So let's go through these a little bit more carefully now and talk about what we've got. So firstly, um, I mean, we're here with Arthritis SA, and I think we all know that the problem with most of the um, inflammatory conditions and arthritic conditions that occur is the inflammation. Now, we must remember that inflammation is a normal part of the body's immune response, and it's there for the body to self-protect itself and to remove any harmful stimuli and to begin the healing process. And when we talk about inflammation, there's two types of inflammation. The first one is the acute inflammation. And this is what starts really rapidly um, and it quickly becomes severe and then it resolves. And a good example is when you scratch yourself and you have a deep scratch and you've you know, unsettled the skin or perhaps even cut the skin. And you'll see that if initially the skin will go red at that site and it will right, get raised. So you will see a bit of swelling. And that's because what the body is doing is sending out messages to the immune system in the body to come and protect that area because there's a potential enemy that's gotten into the body. And so it, call, it has cell mediators, which calls all the cells to that site to defend. And then once it's cleared it up and made sure that there's nothing there that's problematic and killed any invaders, it starts to clear up the site. It's probably good to think about it a bit like an emergency response. So, for example, um, there is an alarm that goes off in a building. It alerts the police. The alarm may also be a fire alarm, so it alerts the fire engine. And what they do is they come to the thing, to the building. They check to see if there's any intruders they've got in. They've checked to see if there's any flare-ups like fire and to put it out and to make sure that everything is settled before they leave. But they've left a big mess when they've done that. And that's when the, um, and I've forgotten the name of it, it's the service that comes in and clears it up afterwards. You know, they fix up the doors. They might put false doors up to lock the door. If the veranda's fallen down, they might prop it up with a stick to make it safe. And so they're cleaning up. And that's what that acute inflammation is. With chronic inflammation, as I'm sure many of you know, it's when that inflammation persists because the body may not necessarily find what's causing the problem. And so it keeps sending more and more police cars there, more and more fire engines to try to find the problem. And as you get more of those responses there, there's more and more swelling all the time. So the question is, can diet do anything for this situation? Um, and so there's been lots and lots of studies looking at different types of dietary interventions for rheumatoid arthritis, as well as the arthritic conditions. And I'm just popping up the details of a couple of the things that I'm using to look at for this talk and where we can get some of the evidence base from. So this one was a paper that was written in 2009 that looked at different dietary interventions for rheumatoid arthritis, and it was actually a systematic review. And remember, the systematic review is where you pull all the data together from one particular study and you analyse it as a totality. And then the next bit of evidence I'm using is something that was just released about two or three months ago, and it is from the European League of Arthritis Research, and it's called The Effects of Diet on the Outcomes of Rheumatic and Musculoskeletal Diseases, and that was also a systematic review and meta-analysis, which informed the recommendations for lifestyle improvement with people that have the um, rheumatic and musculoskeletal diseases. So let's see in a totality what the recommendations are from these reports. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm just going to have a drink of water, excuse me. So firstly, they looked at osteoarthritis and they looked at five particular substances to see what their impact was. Well, sorry, I should start again. They looked at many, many substances, but these were the ones that came out to show that there was a benefit. So it was vitamin D as a supplement. Um, some of you may know that vitamin D is something that we synthesize from our skin being exposed to the sun. Um, the problem is as we get older and our skin gets thinner, it's more and more difficult for us to synthesize adequate vitamin D levels. And sometimes we may need to get our vitamin D levels checked and get supplementation. So I looked at vitamin D, chondroitin and glucosamine, curcumin, which is what we find in turmeric and also fish oil. And chondroitin, of course, is what we find in shark cartilage and glucosamine 
is a glucated um, sort of protein unit. And what they found with all five of these was that there was moderate quality evidence which supported a small positive effect on pain and function associated with osteoarthritis. Now, the reason they said moderate quality evidence um, makes it sound a little bit negative. But what this means is that when they looked more closely at the studies that produced the results, they found that they didn't follow the scientific methodology as well as they should have. And so, for example, one of those things might be that people knew which supplement they were taking. They knew whether they were taking the active form or whether they were taking the placebo. And if you know what you're taking, that can influence you. And that's why we have placebos. Other problems with the studies might have been, for example, that the people that assessed their disease activity knew which groups they were in. So sometimes these problems in the studies can be a big problem. And sometimes they can be a little problem, but all together they said that these studies produced moderate quality as opposed to high quality or low quality. So that can change in the future as more studies are done in a better way. Um, but at the moment, that's where we are with this. And it's a small positive effect. So what that means is you can probably try these supplements for a few months and see whether you get any benefit from them. Um, and normally we do say two, three, four months because sometimes it takes that long for them to start acting and having an effect in the body. So that's those five there. And we'll come back to fish oil a little bit because that's probably one of the ones that has more evidence than the other. Um, with curcumin, as I said earlier, that's what we get in turmeric. It doesn't, um, and normally in those studies, they used supplements where they knew exactly how much curcumin was in the supplement they were taking. So they weren't adding lots of turmeric to their cooking or having turmeric lattes. It was actually through supplements. Um, so, and once again, one of the problems with curcumin and turmeric um, supplements is that they may not all have the same active dose. Now, with rheumatoid arthritis, as opposed to osteoarthritis, they looked at fish oil and found that fish oil, once again, there was moderate quality evidence for a small positive effect on pain for omega-3 fish oils. So once again, what you might want to consider doing is trying fish oil for a few months and seeing whether you get any benefit from it. Um, and this is probably the one that has the most evidence behind it, although it is moderate quality but also where we have a really good understanding of the biological process of it. Now, often when I talk about fish oil, um, a lot of people say to me, I'm actually vegan and I don't want to take fish oil or I don't want to take fish oil for environmental reasons. And so one of the other um, options available is taking flaxseed. And so that's a really big question. Is flaxseed going to do the same thing as fish oil? And so... I just want to look at that a little bit more closely so that you can um, understand the difference between these two. And we will have to go into a bit of the science, but I will make it really easy and step through it really slowly for you so that you can understand it. So fish and flaxseed contain a fatty acid in it called alpha-linolenic acid, or we call it for short ALA. And it's of the omega-3 family, which is the same fatty acid family as EPA and DHA. And so you can see at the end here, and if I point to, don't know, yes, I can use my pointer here. You can see that it's an omega-3 because it's got N3 at the end of each of those. Okay. But see that it's also found in green leafy vegetables and a little bit of it is also found in walnuts. Now, EPA and DHA, which we refer to as the long chain omega-3 fatty acids, are found in fish and fish oil. They're also found in breast milk. Um, so a really valuable source for, you know, a really good reason for babies to be breastfed. But what happens in the body is if you eat ALA, you can convert it to EPA and DHA. But whoops, sorry guys, pressing all the wrong buttons, it has limited conversion in humans. That means we need to consume lots and lots of the flaxseed to get similar levels 
of EPA and DHA if we just consumed fish or fish oil. And there's a further problem. Um, it's more of a problem in males. So this is quite an interesting evolutionary thing. And we think this is linked to the hormones. So men make even less EPA and DHA from ALA. And in particular, they make the, oop, trying to get my arrow there, they make the EPA, but not as much, but they make even less of the DHA. And it's thought to be an evolutionary reason because women, because of pregnancy and making babies, continue to make brains throughout their life, you know, in the babies. And DHA is the fatty acid that you mainly find in the brain. So someone might say, well, is it so relevant then for rheumatoid arthritis? It still is, because from DHA, we make other products that helps the immune system clear up all the debris from when the immune system has gone into action. So in fact, both EPA and DHA are important for resolving arthritis and inflammation. So while ALA is going to be a useful source for people, it's not going to be a really good source as it is consuming EPA and DHA directly. And this puts a lot of people who've decided to become vegan or vegetarian for either um, you know, ethical reasons around the animals, the fish in this case, or the impact it has on the environment in a really difficult position about what they do. There are, they are developing other sources of EPA and DHA through microalgae and through yeast. And they're starting to become available on the market. But once again, because the technology is new, they are a little bit more expensive. Um, so that's a decision that people can start, you know, might need to think about. What we do know with people that take fish oil for rheumatoid arthritis is a small effect, but a positive effect, which is great. But what it also seems to do is delay the introduction of other drugs. So it takes you a longer time to step up to the next line of um, drug treatment for rheumatoid arthritis. So, you know, perhaps one way of looking at all, if you should take these, is going, okay, well, I'm not keen to take it because of my philosophical reasons, but then if it stops me progressing to the next drugs and needing further sorts of treatment, what's the impact of that? And it does get really complicated, but that is how ALA, EPA and DHA works. And I hope I've explained that well, and I'm sure there'll be questions and I can go back over it again if, if I've confused people over this. So the next question people say ask me is which fish oil? So if you're okay with taking fish oil, and this is also relevant for you know, any yeast sources or microalgae sources that you might use is which one? And it really comes down to price and um, acceptability. So you can get liquid fish oil, but some people find that a little bit more challenging to consume. Um, when I was taking the liquid fish oil, I just got to the point where I just, you know, opened up the bottle, took a swig out of the fridge. I know you're not meant to take swigs out of bottles, but I was the only one that was um, taking it and then having some orange juice to follow that down. So, you know, you could kill the taste in your mouth. Other people can't do that, um, and so they're looking at tablets. So it's all a matter of working out um, which one is the cheapest for the dosage of omega-3 fatty acids that you've got in it. And there's lots of different ones on the market these days. Um, there's the regular retail fish oil, which is about 30% omega-3. And for one gram of fish oil, you get about 300 milligrams of EPA and DHA. And then there's what they call double strength or triple strength omega-3 fatty acid supplements. And I don't know what Omega Via is. It must be another brand. I don't know that it's available in Australia. Um, and I'm certainly not recommending that over any other type of fish oil. But then there's others that are even higher. But as they get more concentrated, they also become more expensive. So it's worthwhile checking out the brochures, going online, seeing what the different pharmacies are selling for them for and getting best bang for buck. But how much do you need to take to get this effect? When we've looked at all the studies, it seems you need somewhere between 0.4 to 6 grams of EPA per day, which is quite a bit. So if you're taking, um, you know, the 60% one, that's almost, you know, 10, 12 tablets a day, which is a lot. And that's why the liquid is easier for people. So the median amount you need, they found in the studies was about 3 grams per day. So if you're taking the regular strength omega-3 fish oils, 
that's about 10 to 20 grams of fish oil per day that you need. So we know that fish oil obviously comes from fish. So does eating fish have the same effect? And absolutely, you can consume fish and um, it's actually a really good idea to try to get some of your fish oil fats, some of these omega-3 fats from fish. And the reason I'm saying that is because when they've looked at evidence about omega-3 fats that we find in fish oil, as well as providing benefits for arthritic conditions and inflammatory conditions, we also see that there's benefit in heart disease. But the interesting thing is whilst fish oil supplements provide benefits for people with arthritis, the benefits don't seem to exist for fish oil and heart disease. So it only seems to be if people eat fish that they get a benefit in reducing their risk from heart disease. So that means there's something else in that fish that is having that effect on heart disease. So it could be the type of protein it is. There could be another nutrient in fish that we don't know about yet. So my best advice would be to mix up and replace some of your red meat meals. And we'll see why else this is important later. Some of your processed meat with fish and then supplementing that with fish oil. So what I do is typically I have fish, might have it two or three times a week. And on the days that I don't have fish, I would take some fish oil. So that could be a strategy. But depending on how severe your disease is, you may need to take fish oil every day. So the type of fish that's going to be best, and obviously, is the fatty fish, because the fattier they are, the more of these omega-3 fats they've got in them. And the fattier fish are the smellier ones, because the smell actually comes from these omega-3 fats. So fresh tuna, salmon, brim, snook are all good. Canned salmon and tuna are also good. Canned salmon is probably the better one because they keep more of those omega-3 fats in the salmon as opposed to the tuna, where it seems they seem to cook it out a bit. Um, one of the interesting things is um, a bit of research I'm doing with some researchers from Adelaide Uni is looking at how climate change and particularly the temperature of the oceans may be affecting omega-3 fats in fish. So there's a whole lot of concerns about how climate change and the environmental changes we're seeing will be impacting on these sorts of fats that we, you know, our source of it is from the fish. And so that's why the work on microalgal sources and potentially yeast can be really um, important for us to see what might be happening there. When this review also looked at other inflammatory-based diseases, they looked at all five of these, systematic lupus, uh, spondylarthritis, psoriatic arthritis, scleroderma and gout, they found that there was no benefits from taking any other supplements. So um, once again, we've got to evaluate that in the way that the study was done, where they considered the quality of the studies. And sometimes if there's only one or two studies that have been done on a particular supplement for a particular disease, it's really difficult to make any recommendation from it because one study is simply not enough. Um, with uh, Sjogren's syndrome, this is an, another interesting one where mainly the treatment is around the symptoms of the syndrome. So one of the problems is we get, you know, the dryness, you get dry mouth, throat and nose. And so the dry mouth reduces the ability to produce saliva and to swallow foods. So frequent drinks are important and having drinks with your meals, having moist foods. The omega-3 fats in, in like fish oil may be beneficial for joint pain once again. And if there's other problems that arise, such as weight loss uh, because of the fatigue and the problems with swallowing, it's best to get individualized dietetic support from an accredited practicing dietitian to look at how to solve these problems at the individual level. Then we've got gout. Um, we like to call gout the disease of the kings. Um, so here we have, um, and I've forgotten his name, it is Prince Henry, King Henry, King Henry, trying to remember all the kings. So he was known for having um, gout, and it was mainly because of the large volume of food he used to consume. Um, he was quite, you know, quite morbidly obese, um, and, you know, it was purely down to the large amounts of meat that he used to eat, and as you can see from this diagram here. So with gout, what we need to do is manage acute accounts and attacks, sorry, and prevent further attacks with the use of medications. 
But the other important thing that comes with it is the other risk factors for gout, which is high lipids, so high cholesterol, high triglycerides, high blood pressure, and potentially diabetes or, um, you know, borderline diabetes. And so these can all be managed with a balanced diet as well as managing weight to minimise all of these. Um, so for those that do have gout, to reduce the risk of gout and further attack is to aim to maintain weight within a healthy weight range, ensure there's good hydration as that eliminates the uric acid salts that form in the joints, to reduce or eliminate the intake of alcohol, reduce salt intake, eat a lot more vegetables and limit intake of foods with added sugars, which includes things like soft drinks, and to limit the intake of foods high in purines. And what we need to do is limit our intake of protein to about 0.8 grams of, so that should say per kilo of body weight per day, which is the amount that's recommended um, by national health authorities. So particularly the purine rich foods are these here and those that have gout would be really familiar with these and that includes anchovies, sardines, shellfish, offal, gravy, stock cubes, and also meat and yeast extracts like Vegemite and beer and other alcohol as well. Um, so up to now, with all the inflammatory conditions we've looked at, we've considered individual foods or supplements. Um, and what I want to talk about now is moving away from nutrients. Nutrition, the science of nutrition has largely been what we call reductionist where we have gone, oh, we've got a deficiency. We need to find out what nutrient that is. So for example, the first nutrient um, to be discovered in a deficiency state was vitamin C with scurvy. That was you know, found out in the 1700s. They worked out what food cured the scurvy and that was you know, lemon and orange juice. Um, and so we created this area in nutrition where people were like, Let's find out what nutrient we're missing and we're going to try to replace that nutrient either through a supplement or through a food. And we're moving away from that now because we understand and we realize that the dietary pattern and even perhaps the lifestyle pattern is much more critical rather than focusing on particular foods. Because when you focus on one food, you miss out on another food or you're still including other foods that don't provide us with a lot of nutritional benefit. So... The review that was done in 2009 that I also showed you um, looked at different dietary interventions and those dietary patterns, and they saw five that provided some benefit. So the first one was a low meat or a plant-based or a Mediterranean diet, all roughly the same thing. And what they're able to show, an RCT from Sweden showed benefit on a Mediterranean diet for 12 weeks for just one study. Um, they showed improvements in a lot of those self-assessed health questionnaires related to rheumatoid arthritis. They also showed reduction in inflammatory activity, improved physical functioning compared to the controlled diet. But this only became evident after about six weeks of consuming the diet. That's why we say you need to give things a bit of time to help the body to change to the new areas. And this dietary pattern is thought to work with the high level of monounsaturated fats, also the high level of antioxidants you're consuming through all the plant foods you're eating and a reduction in the meat intake, saturated fat and also ultra processed foods. The second dietary, the rest of these dietary patterns actually are all a bit, you know, um, difficult to follow, um, but they did look at them. And one of them was an elemental diet. And that's when you just simply consume amino acid, carbohydrates and fats, not as food. So quite a horrible diet. And I'm really pleased to say that they found no difference in that because I would hate to put someone on one of these sorts of diets. Um, then the third diet pattern they looked at was an elimination diet where they tried to get rid of all the really allergenic foods that occur in the diet. And this was only one study. They did a those that were in the experimental study in the elimination diet did do a little better, but not much better. But it was also really badly executed study. And once again, this diet is really difficult to eat. Um, it's very plain. It's basically, you know, um, steamed chicken with fruit like pears, um, potatoes, rice, white bread. So it's really bland, almost a white sort of diet because it doesn't contain 
any allergens in it and very difficult to follow and also not very enjoyable. And then the fourth pattern they looked at was the vegan diet. Um, this is somewhat similar to that really high plant-based diet or Mediterranean diet, but there was no animal protein in it. And there's only been two studies that have looked at that. And they compared 12 months of a vegan diet to ordinary diet. And there was about 20% improvement in signs and symptoms, but they that wasn't statistically significant. And it was also, once again, poor quality studies. And then the last pattern they looked at, which is hardly a dietary pattern, was it was fasting uh, for seven to 10 days and then 13 months on a vegetarian diet. There was two studies that looked at that and they found moderate improvements in pain. And fasting's always been something that's come up. A lot of people ask about it. Um, and we generally don't recommend fasting because of the problems. Um, well, there's many problems. The first one is if you go into a fasted state, the medications you take are going to act a little bit differently in your body. So you need to talk to your doctor about that and about which medications you may need to change or stop or alter. So it's a little bit dangerous from that perspective. Um, but also it's not highly sustainable. Um, there are a lot of sort of fasting intermittent dietary patterns that people consume where they try to have the five and two where they eat more on five days, not more, sorry, they eat normal amounts in five days and eat a le little less on the other two days. And those are probably okay to do. But once again, you do need to talk to your doctor if you're on medication for anything for those. Um, so the pattern that came out the most successful and perhaps the most palatable for people in all of those was the Mediterranean diet pattern. I just want to look a little bit more closely at what the Mediterranean dietary pattern is. Now, most people think it's euros, which it's not. The other thing people think is you can just pour a bit of olive oil on all your food and it's not that either. So let's have a look. Um, when people do follow, and I guess the benefit is we do see lower patterns, um, you know, risk and prevalence of rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis when people follow a Mediterranean diet. But even if the evidence isn't of that high quality we're after, what we also know is that it also provides benefits in a whole lot of other conditions, which some people may have along with their inflammatory conditions. So metabolic syndrome, it provides benefit for heart disease. It lowers blood cholesterol. It lowers blood pressure. It can reduce the severity of obesity or overweight. It can reduce your risk of getting diabetes or improving your um, glycemic control, your glucose levels if you have diabetes. It provides cognitive benefit. I've got depression there. But we also know now it actually improves your cognitive ability as you get older. And it also reduces the risk of death. And the impact on these conditions is quite marked with the Mediterranean diet. So, as I said, what is the Mediterranean diet? And this is a really complex slide, sorry, but I wanted to get it all on one for you to have a look at. So we can see up here in this pyramid, um, at the bottom here, they've got dancing and movement. So activity is really important. So I said that we're increasingly looking at dietary patterns as a way of improving health. But the other important thing is the other lifestyle factors such as activity. So physical activity, eating together meals. So we call that the conviviality of meals. And also here there's, you know, we've got dancing, but we've also got more um, structured sports as well. And for the elderly who won't be involved in structured sports, going for walks and always socialising, which is really, really critical as part of the Mediterranean lifestyle. Then the next thing we see is this really, you know, overwhelming level of vegetable and plant food in the diet. You know, all the different colours and each different colour in food has a different bio-nutrient in it, which is beneficial for your health in some way. Bread is also consumed. Whole grain, whole meal, multi-grain bread is what we're after. And also consuming olive oil. Then we have fish and seafood. And then white meat and dairy. And then right up the top is red meats and sweets. And they're eaten not very often. So if we look at actual amounts, high in whole grains, bread, pasta, grains, about five to six serves a day. Fruit, two serves a day. Vegetables, five to ser seven serves a day. And ideally cooked with olive oil in a tomato-based sauce with onion is one of the features. Legumes, lentils, baked beans, um, red kidney beans, all those sorts of 
beans and nuts are really important. They also provide really good cognitive benefit as well. Fish and seafood, two or more times a week if possible. Dairy, preferably fermented. We seem to see increased benefits with fermented dairy, which means your yogurt and your cheeses, because the fermentation changes the structure of the fat that's in that food, which provides increased benefits for reducing inflammation and also benefits for heart disease. Um, extra virgin olive oil. Now, the level that's consumed traditionally in the Mediterranean diet is quite high. That should say meals, sorry. This is 60 to 80 meals a day, which is three to four tablespoons. But if you look at the rest of the diet, it's the only source of fat that is consumed in the diet. And if we analyze the diet of us, average Australians, they would consume about 60 to 80 grams of fat. But a lot of that fat would be from meat um, and, you know, um, takeaway foods and sweets and chocolates and all that sort of thing. So most of the fat needs to be extra virgin olive oil. Slow cooked foods is also important. Um, because when you cook foods really quickly, you increase what we call the Maillard reaction or the browning, and that seems to also have some pro-inflammatory properties. People also like to think that when I recommend the Mediterranean diet, it means they can have a lot of wine, and particularly red wine, because everyone goes, oh, red wine is okay. And it's even up the top here in the pyramid. Um, now, recent evidence from um, World Health Organization shows us that alcohol is actually a known carcinogen. So we have to be really careful about alcohol, and particularly for your own um, history. So if you are going to consume alcohol, and I'm not certainly not suggesting you should start, if you're not, it should only be consumed with meals and less than a glass a day. Um, new guidelines on alcohol from Canada recommend that people drink about three glasses a week. OK, because once you get above that, you've increased your risk for um, many diseases, including cancer and then red meat to be consumed about once a week and sweets and processed foods less than once a week as well. So um, that's what the Mediterranean diet is probably not what people were hoping for, but that's what it is. Um, and. What's come out with evidence from the Mediterranean diet is that there are anti-inflammatory foods and hence anti-inflammatory diets. And if we combine everything we've seen from the evidence about individual foods and supplements and diets, you come up with this, what we call the anti-inflammatory diet, which is effectively the Mediterranean diet. So as we said, high in fish, extra virgin olive oil, fruit and vegetables or colors, nuts, seeds and beans, as much variety as possible. And don't forget the herbs and spices. They are really critical for providing flavour, but they also contain a lot of bioactives in there which are going to be useful. And that's actually one of the studies that Ben was mentioning earlier that we're looking at is to see how many herbs and spices people are eating. And this sort of diet is... Sorry, excuse me. Is what we see in the Australian Guide to Healthy Eating. And I'm sure many of you have seen this diagram before. It tells Australians what they should eat to reduce their risk of disease by about 50%. So that's quite marked. So we've got all the foods here that we've talked about. It's basically the Mediterranean diet with very small amounts of red meat. But what we've got in the corner here, and you can see I've got it, whoops, point on this wrong thing. I've got it in a red circle. These are what we sometimes call the sometimes discretionary or processed foods. And I've just blown them up so everyone can see them really closely. And these are also known as ultra processed food. And in the last year or so, a lot of evidence has come out to show us that ultra processed foods are actually proving to be really bad for health. We also can refer to them as pro-inflammatory foods. So whilst up to now I've been talking about anti-inflammatory foods, there are also foods that drive inflammation even higher. And it's for a variety of reasons. These foods, for example, soft drinks, lollies, you know, cakes, um, biscuits, are high in sugar and added sugar. It's the added sugar in food that's problematic. They're also very high in salt. So even your cupcake here, which you might think just has a lot of sugar, also has a lot of salt in it. And the other thing that they're high in is saturated fats. And these three do drive inflammation. The other problem with ultra-processed foods or processed foods 
is that the structure of the food has been changed. So because it's been mashed, it's been manipulated uh, by the processing techniques, it doesn't resemble the original food that it was. And that, the food matrix being disrupted, affects the way that the nutrients interact with your body and it can also drive inflammation. And I was talking to Ben earlier um, and I said, oh, I had to include a slide because it just came out today, this paper. And what it's looking at is how ultra processed foods may drive the inflammatory process. And it's a really big area of research. So the first thing is that it might be the nutritional quality that's becoming problematic. So you've got all the trans fat, the saturated fats, salts and sugar, which are affecting it. The other problem with ultra processed foods is the non-nutritional aspects of it. So the additives that go into it, the sweeteners, the artificial sweeteners, the emulsifiers, um, by, by phos oh, I can't remember how to say it all in full. We'll just call it BPA. Um, that's much easier. And BPA is what's found in plastic. And a lot of those plastics have now been, have, no longer have BPA, but the replacement that they put in plastics to still make plastic still seems to have that impact on inflammation. And then, of course, acrylamide. And acrylamide is formed when you cook carbohydrates at really high temperature, such as hot chips. And that's why hot chips are a sometimes food or a discretionary food. And potatoes are actually a vegetable. And the other way that these impact is by the gut microbiota. So all of these nutritional and non-nutritional things impact on the microbiome or the bacteria that we have in our gut. And this affects the way our body defends itself, the inflammatory response. Um, but what the other thing is, if you're eating a lot of these ultra processed foods, you're eating less of the foods that are high in fiber. And while people think that having, um, you know, shots of bacteria and, you know, probiotics, fluids or tablets is the best way to improve your microbiome. It isn't because the microbiome actually needs food to survive in your stomach. And the food it eats is the fiber from all the plant foods you're consuming. And the evidence seems to tell us to have the optimal microbiome in your gut and in your body for best health, you need to eat about 30 different plant foods a week. So that's, you know, apples is one, oranges, pumpkin, um, broccoli, um, you know, nuts, um, parsley, all of those things. Each of those foods is counted as one and about a serve of them. So about 30 a week. And so you can see here um, how they've got the nutrients in the food that's problematic, the additives, and then the chemicals which may all affect it. And the way it affects it is by the microbiome here um, because you're reducing the amount of short chain fatty acid that they can consume and also the gut permeability. So some of the emulsifiers that we find in processed foods impact how permeable the gut is. So they allow things, the gut allows things between the cells easier in and out, which it shouldn't. So I always end um, talks I do on nutrition by these two statements, um, one from, you know, two and a half thousand years ago, Hippocrates, who said, let your food be your medicine and your only medicine be your food. He was absolutely correct. Food does play a large role in the development of disease and how you manage the disease. But I think what I'd like to add to Hippocrates, which is a bit cheeky to add something to him, is also the lifestyle. So we know that activity, physical activity is really also important for all these things that we've talked about. And Michael Pollan, um, who much more recent, is a sort of political food writer who said in 2008, eat food, which means don't take supplements, not too much so that you control your, you can control your body weight and mostly plants. And that's probably the most succinct, um, accurate dietary advice I've seen. So, yeah, I, um, we'll end there. I think we might have some questions right. then. We most certainly do. Thank you for that, Evangeline. That was fantastic. I think you covered you covered a lot of the questions that we get um, a lot on our information line and a lot that I get at community talks and things like that, but mm. covered it in the really scientific way and understandable. So that was fantastic.
Thank so you. We do have a few questions and they are open for everyone else who's attending. We've got about 10 or 15 minutes. Um, yeah. The first one is that um, we had this one come in earlier that it seemed to this person that the advice really, especially online, was to mainly eat the, the good foods per se. Um, and then they were thinking that maybe this would be, you know, a little bit boring and not so much a balanced diet. Is the motto that it's really all things in moderation? Yeah, although look, I hear that so often. And when people say all things in moderation, what they're hoping for is that it includes a little bit of ease. And the evidence is showing that even if people meet the Australian dietary guidelines and eat their fruit and vegetables, even having one to two serves of these ultra processed foods can still be bad. And uh, I guess I'd like to challenge, and I know I've been a dietitian for a long time and I'm totally biased, that notion that it's, um, you know, the good food might be the boring food. Because I just want to point out some cultural foods that are going to be really healthy and also really yummy. So Mexican, right? Lots of vegetables in there, grains, rice, bread, herbs and spices. You can vary the amount of chili that you put in there. Avocado, really yummy. Indian, with all the different curry styles they've got. I would just hold back on the amount of coconut milk and coconut fat that goes into them. But there's certainly a lot of red-based curries that are also really yummy. And then, look, I just think about all those beautiful fruits that are available and we're so lucky to have here in Australia. You know, your berries, your pineapples, your mangoes. Um, and we're certainly not saying don't eat processed foods, but I think it's probably about becoming a little bit more selective and going, well, look, yeah, I eat lollies, but they don't really do much for me. Maybe I'll make that sometimes food something really special that I really enjoy. So, you know, a really nice cake or a really nice... Um, you know, tart or something, or I'm going to get a really nice piece of dark chocolate rather than, you know, your cheap and nasty chocolate. So sort of rethinking what we think is delicious. It's it's more so that holistic approach about it all and rather than putting things in good and bad categories, thinking mm. about it overall more so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, having whole grain toast with your favourite flavour jam. Perfect. Yeah. We've got a, an interesting one, um, mm. and this person is asking, does vitamin D help with rheumatoid arthritis at all? Uh, yeah, it, well, no, the study didn't show an effect, but that might be because of the limited number of studies that are looked at it. But generally, vitamin D has anti-inflammatory components. So it's really important as part of the inflammation process. So for anyone who's probably, you know, if you haven't had your vitamin D tested, you should probably get it tested, particularly as you get older, if you're avoiding the sun more for, you know, skin cancer concerns and all that sort of stuff. Because if your vitamin D levels are low, it's a problem for all of the inflammatory system in the body. Um, so I wouldn't want it to be low and have arthritis is my answer. Good, good answer for that one. Um, another person is asking specifically about the Mediterranean diet. Does that apply to older people as well? Is there an age range or is it just everyone? It's everyone. Look, um, what when they did the initial studies in the Mediterranean diet, it was in the 1960s, so it was post-World War II, and they compared the health of the people in Crete with people others in other European countries. And despite Crete having the worst health service, having the highest rate of poverty, the lowest rate of education and the highest rate of smoking, they came out with lower levels of heart disease and cancer than any of the other European cohorts. And they did look in the elderly population. And what we see in the elderly, elderly population is it seems to protect against muscle loss as well. It improves cognitive benefits and all that as well. I guess what one of the concerns might be if there's other problems along, you know, other health problems or if there's chewing problems they may not be getting as much protein in but generally 99 percent of the Australian population eat enough protein so protein isn't you know a huge concern but if there's other health problems it might be a good idea to go and see a dietitian perfect so pretty much any age range it's the recommendation absolutely any age range. Someone's asking if you can please elaborate on the slow cooked versus fast cooked and then some examples of each. Right. Okay. That's a good question. So when um, one of the things that people love about um, food when it's cooked in high temperatures or barbecuing is that caramelization we get. 
And we call that the Maillard reaction, M-A-I-L-L-A-R-D, if anyone wants to look it up. And it's that caramelization forms what we call in science something called ages, which is advanced glycation end products. And what that seems to do is increase inflammation reactions um, and increase the aging of the body. So fast cooking is barbecuing at a really quick temperature, you know, where it gets brown quite quickly. Um, you know, when you, you know, when they get blow torches and they torch the pavlova and the meringues, that sort of thing. So the slower you cook your food, so casseroles, stews, soups, which are on a low constant heat and reduce that caramelization seem to be best for health. And it actually becomes more problematic as you get older and your renal function declines. Um, so really critical, um, or not really critical, but as much slow cooked food as you can consume, the better it is. And when you think of those traditional Mediterranean recipes, people think of meat on the barbecue. That only probably happened about three times a year in the 60s in the Greek villages, um, because any animals they did have, they kept for, you know, eggs or milk. Um, but even when they did cook it, the lamb was cooked for a good 24 hours high above the heat. So it wasn't that quick cooking. So try to slow cook as much as you can. Perfect. Um, this next question is an interesting one. I think one that um, when we do diet talks and things like that comes up and not always touched upon. Can you, can you talk about dehydration and arthritis? Is there effect if people don't have enough water in their diet? Um, yeah, look, dehydration affects every body system. Um, so we know that physical performance is impacted by dehydration when your levels drop by about 2%, um, which isn't a lot. And then cognitive function declines at 5%. So the body is accustomed to working in conditions where there's a certain level of hydration. So effectively, everything is impacted. The only place where I would caution that is where people might have congestive cardiac failure or have renal disease and they're on water restrictions. So they should talk to their doctors about it. But you should be consuming about two litres of fluid a day, not water. You always hear it as water, but it's just fluid. So the fluid in your soup counts, the fluid in your coffee and your tea counts. I'm not going to count the fluid in your wine and alcohol because you shouldn't be drinking too much of it. Um, milk counts. So milk is a really good hydrating um, you know, fluid as well. And what you should see is when you wake up in the morning, your morning wee should be light hay colour. So check it out in the morning. Um, obviously, the hotter the day, you're going to need to drink a little bit more. If you do gardening or you go exercising outside, walking, all of those will affect your hydration. But just keep an eye on that and try to make that morning wee colour, morning urine colour, a hay colour, light hay colour. I'm getting mixed up with all the words there about your professional opinion on sauerkraut and fermented foods and probably more going into that gut biome. Do you have any comments on those? Mm, yeah. Look, whilst I said taking um, capsules and little fluid shots of, you know, bacteria or probiotics isn't needed, certainly fermented foods are good because they do contain the microbiome in there. But the fermentation process also changes some of the nutrients to new types of nutrients. Um, so, for example, kombucha, which is tea, when it's fermented, some of those antioxidants are slightly changed to form new antioxidants. So try and have fermented foods. You don't have to go for the really crazy stuff. Yoga is fermented. Cheese is fermented. Sauerkraut, kimchi, kombucha, kefir, all those things. So you should be having some fermented foods in your diet. Um, but... I always go, look, eat the foods you enjoy within, you know, within this circle here, this pie diagram. Um, and if you don't like kombucha, and I don't like it, I find the taste a little bit weird. I just enjoy drinking tea. But you need those fermented foods and then you need the fibre that that bacteria will eat as well. That's really critical. That's, that's a really good way of understanding it because I know from especially the medical background, there's lots of, lots of uh, interest in the gut biome and there's always this focus on, just the probiotics mm. in fermented foods or even the tablets rather than thinking about actually keeping them alive. So that's, that's a fantastic yeah. way of putting it. Yeah, but absolutely. Someone's asking if you make your own cakes or sweets, 
um, and then you moderate the sugar in those. Does that still come under the category of your processed food or is it a little bit different in those cases? Yeah, no, look, that's a really good question. I didn't mention what the definition of processed and ultra processed foods are. Um, and processed foods are things like, you know, milk and yogurt and cheese, because we need a certain level of processing of food to get it from the paddock to the plate. Ultra processed food, and the best example of describing it is potato crisps. So when you have potato crisps in a packet, typically what's happened is the potato is thinly sliced and then it's deep fried a few times to get that crispiness. But when you look at Pringles, you know those potato crisps that come in the tube? What's happened there is the potato has been turned into a powder and it's been mashed back into a shape and then deep fried. And that's ultra processing where you can't actually make it at home. So ultra processed foods are those foods you can't make at home in a normal kitchen. So your cake, which is baked with, you know, oil in it or a polyunsaturated or monounsaturated margarine is going to be fine. It's not what is you know made out in the market because it's not going to have additives in it like emulsifiers and preservatives you just have you know fruit flour egg oil milk you know and whatever flavoring you want and certainly if you can drop the sugar in it that's great um but what might be best is you know if you add a little bit of sugar it may not make a huge difference to the kilojoules but you might eat less of it because it actually tastes better as well. So there's always that balance about still making it taste good so you don't want to overeat it. Maybe people eat more when it does taste good. I don't know, but yeah. Does gluten set off people with pain? Like is it known that gluten in some people it can trigger their pain? Look, if there's an underlying problem with gluten, it may. And this is where sometimes you can't give out general advice to everyone because for 95% of the population, that gluten thing won't be relevant. But for other people, it might be. So the problem with gluten is that people that have celiac disease, it causes um, you know, a reaction in the stomach. But for other people, they can have a intolerance to gluten. Um, it's not as widely prevalent as we'd like to think it is with all the people that are going on gluten-free diets. And you certainly want to get some medical advice if you think there's a problem. Because there's also data out there to show that people who follow gluten-free diets actually have worse outcomes if they don't have celiac disease. So you certainly don't want to do it if you don't have a problem. But it wouldn't surprise me if people do have a reaction to it and it increases pain. Because if you're increasing inflammation in one spot, trying to defend the body, that could well translate to across to other areas as well. That's a good answer for it. Um... And my, my final question that tonight is, can tomatoes and nightshade vegetables, can they cause arthritis? <laughs> they certainly won't cause arthritis, but what people might find is that it exacerbates their symptoms. Um, and when I talk to people about if they think a particular food is a problem, we like to test it out on three separate occasions because it could be something else that's happening in their life, something random, coincidental that's causing it. And I always think it's a shame to completely drop out a food group if you don't need to. Um, quite clearly, I love food. Um, so, you know, when you think there might be a problem, um, eat it, see what happens, record it. Don't eat it for a bit. Eat it again and record it and see what happens. And if you think after three or four times of doing this that you do have a genuine response to it, then you can go, okay, you know, perhaps I'll try and eat less of it. But it certainly doesn't cause it. Um, and you're going to be worried if you drop a whole food group. If you go, oh, well, every time I eat vegetables, I get a reaction. Yeah, that doesn't cut it. I say there's about only about two or three foods that everyone can say they won't eat. And then once you go above two or three, it's like, yeah, no, you've got to get it sorted out and see exactly what the problem is. So don't cut out food groups um, because we've got them separated in these different things because each of these different food groups provides a different, really important nutrient for your health. Thank you, everyone, for tonight. Um, thank you for coming along and taking out this Monday night to spend some time with us. And thank you very much to you, Evangeline. It's greatly thank appreciated. You. My pleasure. Had a great time. This, um, this webinar was made possible through funding from the country South Australia Primary Health Network. Um, and from here at Arthritis SA, we hope everyone enjoys the rest of the night. Thank you.